how will we travel in the future? What are the technologies that are being developed today that are going to impact the way that we move from A to B in the year 2030? I'm lucky that we work a great deal with industry and we have a little bit of insight into the, some of the trends that are coming into play. And um, I have here a couple of movie versions of what travel was going to look like in the future. Now, both of these have actually become a reality in recent times. And some of you will have seen a video by Lexus where they've demonstrated the hoverboard works. And it's actually not that practical. You need super cool, super capacitors and a magnetic ground structure, but it is possible. So what science fiction stories from now are going to become reality in the future? First of all, let's look to the past. Travel used to be fun. It used to be glamorous. There were cocktails and canapes. We had the Concorde that halved flight times around the world. And uh, it's n you never hear this phrase anymore, that, is, that something is as pretty as an airport, to paraphrase Douglas Adams. We, we just don't see that kind of architecture in airports anymore. So most of us now, when we get ready to go on holidays, we pack our bags, we get really excited, we head to the airport and we head straight into this. And then this. So we get stuck in that tube with hundreds of other people. And commuting to work isn't that much fun either. We're stuck in traffic, we have overcrowded trams and trains. So what's the future going to look like? Hopefully we can resolve some of these issues. As the population increases, the demand on these systems is going to increase even more. So I'm reminded of a crisis meeting that took place in London in the late 19th century where the leaders of the city got together to discuss how they were going to resolve this problem of increasing traffic and the enormous um, unmanageable amount of horse manure that it was creating in London. The solution, of course, was the automobile, but that didn't come for a few years. And so we may not have the solution to our problems immediately. It may be something we haven't imagined yet, a complete paradigm shift. But what I'm going to do today is summarise the major trends that we're seeing and the products that are being developed in by industry. So I'm interested in transport because I work with carbon fibre composite materials and uh, the majority of the research in my team focuses on lightweighting transport to improve fuel economy and reduce environmental emissions in transport. Now these materials are ultra high strength, um, very tough materials, they're about five times the strength of steel but about a fifth of the weight. They um, are made from a carbon fibre fabric, which you can see on the slide, which consists of bundles of carbon fibres, which are filaments that are seven microns in diameter. So they're about a tenth the diameter of a human hair. These are bound together by an epoxy matrix and they're heated and cured, usually in a giant oven, and that's going to become an important thing to remember later in my presentation. So you get the stiffness and strength of the fibre, and the toughness of the epoxy matrix. Now, these are an example of an engineered material, and we're moving into a new age of engineered materials. We're moving beyond digging materials out of the ground, heating them and forming them and shaping them, creating a lot of waste, into a, an area, an arena where we're designing materials from molecules up. Now, three-dimensional printing is one example of this trend. But carbon fibre composites are the ultimate engineered material because you can tailor the strength of the part by carefully aligning fibres. We have a brand new centre that's focused on carbon fibre and composite research at Deakin and it's, it's really unique. The key feature is the pilot line that you can see in the hall there and it's the only one of its size and scale at a university anywhere in the world. It gives us unprecedented insight into developing new materials for industry and the ability to make them at scale um, in, a, in a scale that's relevant to industry so that we can create prototype parts from our new materials that industry can evaluate. We go right through from molecules to materials in one location. The other unique thing is that behind the Carbon Nexus building that you can see in the foreground, there's a building that belongs to CSIRO. So we're co-located with over 80 scientists from CSIRO and to have the National Lab focused on textile research alongside us has given us um, some great capabilities. And Carbon Nexus is embedded in the Institute for Frontier Materials, which is a research institute dedicated to material science research. And it contains over 300 staff and students. So we have uh, a significant critical mass of researchers here at Deakin. So 
Wouldn't it be amazing if a plane could fly like a bird? The future of flight is actually fly by feel, and it has the potential to increase maneuverability, efficiency, and safety. So the key aspects to fly by feel are sensing and actuating, feeling and then responding. So I recently um, attended a conference in Copenhagen where the latest sensor technology was presented. And when you embed sensors into transport, you also generate a huge amount of data. And one of the other mega trends that we're seeing in transport is that the ability to handle large amounts of data and analyse it quickly to give you the outcomes that you want. So, so that's going to be really critical for the future so that we can um, track and monitor the safety of our transport. So this is the latest sensor network. This is a bio-inspired uh, aircraft wing covered in sensors. And the researchers who presented this work identified that there was a gap and that whilst they could provide the technology to sense wind currents and change in, in um, thermal currents, they didn't yet have the technology to actuate materials. And it reminded me of a project that we'd done at Deakin. This is the work of um, Sahana Gashin and Matt Barnett and myself. And this is a composite com component that is actually being actuated by heat. So you can see it, it can change um, shape enormously when you heat and cool it. And you can also actuate it by applying a current. So you could just switch a current into this material and it will respond to that current. So this could be part of the solution that we need for fly-by-feel. Now this uh, has just been announced in the last week by Airbus that they're going to build Concorde 2.0. And I don't know about you, but as an Australian, I would love to see some supersonic flights. You know, um, I know that it's a day trip to Europe, but it's 24 hours, a very long day, cooped up in an aircraft, and it would be incredible if we could shorten that flight time. So I was really excited to see Airbus focusing on this. Now, when I was doing my PhD about 20 years ago in the 90s, the main motivation for my research was to understand high temperature composite materials for an aircraft called the High Speed Civil Transport. This aircraft was going to revolutionise the way we travelled. However, when you fly at twice the speed of sound, you get friction heating at the surface of the aircraft, and the aircraft heats up to, up to 177 degrees Celsius. And so the material science challenge to develop materials for these applications that can withstand those temperatures for long periods of time are really quite intense. And so, um, unfortunately, just, well, luckily for me, just after I submitted my thesis, that whole program was uh, cancelled. So I just got my thesis in before that happened. But it's been interesting that there's been this resurgence of interest in supersonic flight. Now, the, the Concorde 2.0 is a completely different model. It's actually a rocket, and it flies at four and a half times the speed of sound. So really fast speeds, a lot of friction heating there. And Airbus claimed that it can get you from uh, London to New York in just an hour, which is phenomenal. It'd be really interesting to see what happens there. So the way we're going to get to work in the year 2030 is going to change too. And there's an, some incredibly interesting technologies coming through in the automotive sector. The major trends are this move to electric vehicles, and that's demanding lightweight structures. I've got a picture there of the BMW i3, which is a zero emissions electric vehicle that has a carbon fibre chassis. So BMW and Tesla in particular have been spearheading the drive to electric vehicles and becoming more and more popular. And there's a picture of the BMW i8 there, which is, is actually a pretty sexy looking car. It's pretty good. So one of the problems with electric vehicles is range anxiety, and that's the fear that I jump in my car now, I head to Melbourne, and my batteries run out on the Westgate Bridge, and I'm left stuck there. And the way to deal with range anxiety is to actually um, lightweight the structure so that you can go further with the car. And that's where composites are playing a big role. And the work that we're doing at Deakin uh, with industry, we've got a, a number of projects that are, that are focused on this. One of them is with Futurus, where we've worked with them for many years to develop lightweight seat structures for, for, for cars. The other one is with a company called Multimatic. Now, when I was doing my PhD 20 years ago, it used to take six to eight hours to make one composite part. 
So in the last decade, it's come down to well under an hour. But a Ford comes off the production line every minute in Detroit. How can we possibly keep up with those sort of times? And so we developed a process and a material with Multimatic that is capable of making components in just one minute. And we, we just uh, were able to do that last year. The other great debate is whether we're going to go to driverless cars or driver-assisted cars. And I think in the future we're going to see a combination of both. I think as human beings we kind of like to be in control and it's kind of hard to let go and let the car drive itself. And there are a number of driver-assisted features that we already have in our cars. We use cruise control, we have ABS brakes. And I think in, in the very near future we're going to see a cruise control equivalent that will switch the car into an autonomous driving mode. But you always have the option of switching it off. So it's going to be completely different in, in the future generations. Our grandchildren are not going to worry about whether they need to steer the car or not. And in fact, they probably won't even have a need to get a driver's licence. Public transport is also going to change enormously in the future. The ability to track and measure and handle the big data I mentioned earlier about um, is going to drive efficiency and reliability. So we're going to see more efficient and reliable public transport. There's going to be an increased demand from us as passengers for, for better comfort and connectivity. We all want to access Wi-Fi so we can use the commute to work as an office. But the potential game changer is Elon Musk's Hyperloop. Now, Elon Musk has a proposal to build an enormous tube between Los Angeles and San Francisco by the year 2025. And in this tube, he will um, propel passenger pods that uh, can, will travel at the speed of sound incredibly fast and they will get you from Los Angeles to San Francisco in 30 minutes. There's currently a design competition. You can design the future passenger pod and I think um, the design competition closes relatively soon. So if you've got any thoughts on this, there's your opportunity to contribute. Now the estimated cost for this is around $6 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, but in, in fact if you're building infrastructure for rail, it, it's actually quite comparable. So this is going to be really interesting to watch. So I'm now going to talk about two Australian companies that are leading the world in providing lightweight solutions for transport. Now both of these companies have worked with Deakin for more than a decade. They have Deakin in their genes and they both have a, a presence here on campus. First one is Carbon Revolution. Carbon Revolution make the world's first one-piece carbon fibre wheel. Now they started as a, a spin-out from some technology that was developed by Deakin staff and students for the Formula SAE competition. And that was spun out into a very, very successful company. They now um, have been selected to supply wheels for Ford's new Mustang GT350R, which is an incredible achievement for them. And that is a picture of their new factory, which is just up the hill on campus here. The other company is Quickstep. Quickstep have a new technology for rapidly curing composites. And it's capable of making really, really large structures, like an aircraft wing. Quickstep have become the, Australia's largest independent supplier of composite components and they're making parts for both the aerospace and automotive industry. And they, again, have a presence here on campus. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the history of the Deakin Quickstep partnership and uh, there's a little bit of my history thrown into it. Um, so Quickstep was invented by Neil Graham in the 1990s when he was making an aircraft called the Eagle. And he really wanted to make some components using composite materials, but he didn't, couldn't afford an autoclave. So he literally had a eureka moment in the bath where he thought, why don't we give the composite a bath? So he invented a process that surrounds the part with two flexible fluid-filled bladders that um, flow heat through past the part, and it's kind of like a toasted sandwich press that surrounds the part and cooks it. So in the late 90s, he worked with my PhD supervisor, Jonathan Hodgkin, who was at CSIRO, and they built the prototype quick-step machine from old hot water services. And they showed that it was viable and it worked really well. So I arrived at Deakin as a really fresh, young PhD graduate with no grey hair at that time. Um, really, I was recruited by Peter Hodgson. He wanted me to establish composite research here, and I had no way to make a composite. So it took a while, but I managed to convince him to buy a quick-step machine. 
And that's our very first quick step machine there. The current generation of that technology looks completely different. And so we bought the quick step machine and we started doing some research with it and showed that, again, it was really, really promising. And the research that we did was used to help Quickstep list on the Australian Stock Exchange in 2005. But in 2003, I was a one-person research group, and Quickstep were a startup with an inventor and three employees at that time. So we also had a lot of fun on the way. We used to have these global technology exchanges in Fremantle, and, and that's us on the uh, boat that was owned by one of the Quickstep guys. And just to anyone considering careers in engineering and science, it's a lot of fun along the way. So the guys that you see there are all from my PhD team at the time, and all of the guys in that photo now work for Carbon Revolution, including the two inventors and founders of the company. And um, I have to say I have no part in the success of Carbon Revolution. As a PhD supervisor, it was my role to very helpfully and supportively nag them to finish their thesis which they all did, and they've done brilliantly well to be able to combine that with creating a successful startup. So they've, they've just done incredibly well. So my group's grown over the years, and one thing that, that I'm really proud of is that we always have had a high proportion of women in my group, and they've been smart, articulous, fabulous, talented engineers. And so for any females, um, any women looking for careers in engineering, I'd like to really to encourage you to consider your options because when I was studying, I thought engineering was all about building bridges and now I realise it's about working in teams of people, coming up with creative solutions that have an impact on society. <coughs> this is where we are today. So we have a team of around 30 staff and students and scientists and engineers. We have a fantastic facility. And the photo that you see there is actually taken on, was taken on Monday. And that's, that's our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Jane Den Hollander, who's really made sure that Deakin is leading the way in terms of working with industry. Now, she's with Tony Quick, the chairman of Quickstep, and Dave Marino, the CEO. And they made an announcement on Monday that Quickstep were investing $13 million in a new facility here on campus at Deakin and they're relocating all of their R&D here. So if someone had told me 15 years ago that that was going to happen, I would have never have believed them. So how will we travel in the future? I think we've got a lot to look forward to. I think in the future, travel's going to become more autonomous, more environmentally friendly, more fuel efficient, more comfortable, and there's going to be more flexibility within services. So most importantly, in Australia, and particularly in Geelong, we're developing technology to create new lightweight structures that are going to impact travel, and they're seeding industry and supporting industries of the future. So who says it isn't possible to strengthen the planet and strengthen the economy at the same time? <laughs>